Welcome to our channel. In this video we will review some facts about ancient Egypt. But before we start, please like this video and subscribe to our channel for future updates. It is surprising that ancient Egypt arose in such a severe and unfriendly area as the Sahara Desert. Because of this, the ancient Egyptians thought the Nile River to be the source of all life. The ancient Egyptian monarchy would not have existed without the Nile. We would not have the pyramids, the Sphinx, and many other legacies they left for us today if they had not left them. Without the Nile, much of Egypt would be uninhabitable. Many aquatic species reside in the river, as do hundreds of terrestrial species that live along its banks. The people dread and venerate many of the animals that dwell in and around the Nile. The ancient Egyptians even adored some of them. Almost everything essential in Egypt is located on or near the Nile. Discover more astonishing facts about the world's oldest country. Check out these 50 fascinating facts about ancient Egypt. The ancient Egyptians never called their country Egypt. Egypt gets its name from the ancient Greek name for the country, Aegyptos, which is a corruption of the Egyptian name for Memphis, Hikupatar. Instead, the ancient Egyptians referred to their homeland as Kemet. This literally means, black land, referring to the rich black mud left behind by the annual floods of the Nile. This, combined with the Nile's water, enabled ancient Egyptian fields to produce large crops, supplying sustenance for their people. This contrasted with the dry deserts that surrounded the Nile Valley. These were known as, Dishrei, which means, red land. There were two significant political divisions in ancient Egypt. They were known as Lower and Upper Egypt. Lower Egypt is responsible for the Nile Delta, whereas Upper Egypt is responsible for the Nile Valley up to the first set of rapids at Aswan. The first pharaoh's claim to monarchy was based on his successful unification of Upper and Lower Egypt. The P.S. Chent, or double crown worn by all pharaohs, became a reference to this. It included Upper Egypt's white headjet crown and Lower Egypt's red dishray crown, as well as their respective animal symbols. Lower Egypt was represented by a cobra, which also represented the goddess Wajet. Upper Egypt was represented by a vulture, as was the goddess Nekbet, who became known as the two ladies along with Wajet. The ancient Egyptians spent a century perfecting the pyramid. Archaeologists can trace the evolution of the pyramid in ancient Egypt back to the steppe pyramid at Saqqara. Imhotep, a priest and architect, conceived and oversaw its construction for Pharaoh Djoser in the 27th century BC. After his death, Imhotep's accomplishments would lead to his deification. In fact, Imhotep's work would be expanded upon by ancient Egyptian architects and engineers over the next century. This resulted in the construction of the Bent Pyramid in Darshur around the beginning of the 26th century BC. It was built for Pharaoh Sneferu of the 4th dynasty by Egyptians. Continuous pyramid improvement culminated in the finalized design of the Great Pyramid of Giza in the middle of the 26th century BC. Egypt had an abundance of gold. Their first mines were discovered in the Eastern Desert, which lies between the Nile and the Red Sea. The region's gold mines proved so profitable that they stayed in operation throughout Roman times and far into the Islamic Golden Age of the 8th to 14th centuries AD. Later, throughout the Middle and New Kingdoms, Egypt's southern expansion resulted in the discovery of more gold mines in Nubia. The Nubian gold mines, located in contemporary Sudan, continue to produce material to this day. During the middle of the second millennium BC, ancient Egypt's gold treasure made it the richest kingdom in the world. This immense riches also contributed to their military dominance in the late Bronze Age, allowing them to arm more soldiers and fight longer wars than their opponents. Thutmose I and Thutmose III were two of Egypt's finest pharaohs. Thutmose I was the third pharaoh of the 18th dynasty and the New Kingdom. Thutmose I conquered Nubia, including what is now Sudan into Egypt's expanding empire. His grandson Thutmose III carried on Egypt's expansion, but in the opposite direction. Thutmose III led a campaign northward into Asia's Mediterranean coast, conquering Palestine and Syria. He also changed policy, at least in terms of his Asian conquests. The pharaoh chose a viceroy to administer in their name in Nubia, and the province was ruled as part of Egypt. Thutmose III, on the other hand, enabled local rulers in Syria and Palestine to preserve their thrones as long as they paid regular tribute to the pharaoh. Only one woman reigned as pharaoh. Hatshepsut began as Thutmose I's daughter and the sister wife of Thutmose II, his son and successor. Hatshepsut acted as regent for her stepson, the future Thutmose III, after her brother died of plague, but later usurped the throne as pharaoh. Unlike her father, and later her stepson, Hatshepsut prioritized home affairs over foreign victories. 
Egypt became the center of trade in the eastern Mediterranean under her rule, bringing immense prosperity to the country. She utilized her fortune to construct new roads, temples, bridges, irrigation systems, and other infrastructure. This earned her the reputation of being one of the greatest pharaohs in Egyptian history, as well as the first really magnificent woman in history. Pharaoh Amenhotep IV attempted to introduce religion into Egypt. Amenhotep IV was the 10th monarch of Egypt's 18th dynasty, and he attempted to replace Egypt's many gods with just one. Specifically, Amenhotep made Aten, who was once merely an inconspicuous element of the sun god Ra, the focal point of his new religion. As part of this, he changed his name to Akhenaten and established a new capital, Akhetaten, in modern-day Armana. In practice, however, worship of Aten became isolated to the city, while devotion of the old Egyptian gods persisted everywhere else. Following Akhenaten's death, Aten worship ceased, and the city of Akhetaten was abandoned. Pharaohs after him damaged Akhenaten's monuments and even removed his name from most records. In fact, most sources simply refer to Akhenaten as a criminal or as Amenhotep IV, his old name. Tutankhamun succeeded Amenhotep IV as Egypt's pharaoh. Following the death of his father, Akhenaten, he became pharaoh as Tutankhamun as part of the restoration of ancient Egypt's traditional religion. Tutankhamun was crowned at the age of eight and reigned with the assistance of various counselors. His rule was only nine years long, and his death became a matter of contention among researchers. Most scholars formally thought his regent A assassinated Tutankhamun in order to become pharaoh himself. However, an examination of the pharaoh's body revealed no evidence of murder. A theory that the pharaoh perished in a chariot accident also proved inconclusive, with apparent injuries in his body rather than being discovered as the result of tomb thieves. Archaeologists now assume the pharaoh died of malaria, with parasite fragments from his mummy serving as evidence. Tutankhamun's tomb is still the most complete ancient Egyptian tomb ever uncovered. When Howard Carter found the tomb in 1922, every other tomb in Upper Egypt's Valley of the Tombs had previously been robbed. They had not only stolen the treasures buried with the pharaohs and their queens, but they had also destroyed their mummies. The tomb robbers had even stolen the mummies in certain cases. Indeed, tomb thieves had previously attacked Tutankhamun's tomb, with Carter calculating that the treasures he discovered amounted for only 40% of what the ancient Egyptians had buried with the pharaoh. Despite this, the pharaoh's mummy remained in his tomb, along with at least some of his possessions, such as a model boat, many chariots, and a meteoric iron knife. The mummies of the pharaoh's two stillborn children were also kept in his tomb. Archaeologists have discovered no other tomb as complete as Tutankhamun's. Ramesses II is still considered the finest pharaoh of ancient Egypt. His people referred to him as Ramesses the Great even during his lifetime. As the third pharaoh of the 19th dynasty, he reigned from 1279 to 1213 BC. When the so-called Sea Peoples invaded Egypt in 1278 BC, he rose to power. Ramesses beat him off and permitted him to serve in his army, which the Egyptians considered as an act of kindness. Ramesses spent the rest of his reign putting down revolts in Syria before attacking the Hittite Empire in Anatolia, modern-day Turkey. This resulted in the signing of the world's oldest recorded peace treaty, with the ancient Egyptians and Hittites delineating their separate regions. Ramesses also constructed the Great Temple at Abu Simbel and the Ramesseum near Thebes. In addition, he transformed his father Seti the first summer house in Lower Egypt into a new metropolis called Pi Ramesses. Historians consider a variety of elements in the decline of ancient Egypt. The most important factor of all was the end of the Bronze Age and the beginning of the Iron Age. The widespread introduction of iron weaponry and armor, particularly in the second half of the 2nd century BC, rendered Egypt's forces obsolete. Egypt had large copper reserves, which gave them an edge throughout the Bronze Age because they just needed to acquire tin to alloy copper with in order to make bronze. However, Egypt lacked iron reserves, and while the ancient Egyptians could import iron, they were still at a disadvantage against opponents that possessed their own iron. Worse, Egypt had become politically unstable at this point, and had even split along Upper Lower Egyptian lines. Lower Egypt was ruled by merchant princes, while Upper Egypt was ruled by priests from Thebes. This, combined with Egypt's warriors' obsolescence, made them vulnerable to foreign conquerors. Ancient Egypt's governance was complex. The pharaoh sat atop the pyramids, allegedly as a god-king with absolute control over Egypt. In practice, the pharaoh had to strike a balance between the opposing interests and ambitions of his court groups. The nobility, writers, merchants, soldiers, and priesthood were among them. 
The vizier, the ancient Egyptian equivalent of a modern prime minister, stood directly beneath the pharaoh. No marchers, or provincial governors, reported directly to the vizier, with each no march in charge of one of ancient Egypt's 42 provinces, or gnomes. The priesthood was the most powerful element in the pharaoh's court, with all levels of administration having to appease them to some extent. This sprang from the fact that, as previously said, temples doubled as granaries and treasuries. As a result, the temples became the economic backbone of ancient Egypt, with the priests determining the nation's food and wealth. They had a hierarchical society as well. The pharaoh and the nobility ruled Egypt, with the educated elite of doctors, engineers, scribes, and the priesthood immediately beneath them. The skilled craftsmen and artisans who transformed raw materials into usable equipment and commodities for sale came next. Finally, farmers comprised the lowest stratum of ancient Egyptian civilization, accounting for the vast majority of ancient Egyptians. While slavery existed in ancient Egypt, experts are divided on its exact status. Slaves in ancient Egypt might supplement their income and finally buy their freedom. Slaves had access to public physicians, and former slaves may eventually climb to become nobility. Women in ancient Egypt had various liberties. Women had equal legal standing with men, which Greek and Roman women did not have. They may also own, sell, and inherit property, as well as develop and run their own businesses. Women in ancient Egypt had a say in their marriages, and marriage contracts were used to protect their rights in the event of a divorce. While only one woman ever became pharaoh, many more became scribes and healers, with royal high priestesses exerting significant power in ancient Egypt. Ancient Egypt also had a sophisticated legal system. Legal records discovered in ancient Egypt demonstrated that the ancient Egyptians regarded the spirit of the law as much as the word of the law. In ancient Egypt, Kenbet councils of local elders operated as courts, handling trials for petty offences. Major crimes, including as murder and robbery, were instead prosecuted before the vizier, or perhaps even the pharaoh. Whatever the judge was, scribes usually kept meticulous records for future reference. The penalties varied depending on the crime, with lesser offences resulting in fines or beatings. Major crimes, on the other hand, may result in exile, mutilation, and, of course, death. The ancient Egyptians had a thriving agriculture industry. Wheat made up the majority of ancient Egypt's harvests and was used to make several types of bread. Ancient Egyptian farmers also farmed barley, which was used to make beer, which quickly became a popular item in Egypt. So much so that employees frequently received beer instead of grain as remuneration. Beer barrels were often used as funerary offerings in graves, and beer recipes were engraved as part of tomb texts. Flax was farmed in ancient Egypt and used to make linen for clothing, with Egyptian linen being famous throughout the Mediterranean. Even now, Egyptian linen is a significant export, commanding high prices on the global market. They also grew papyrus for paper, as well as garlic, leeks, beans, lettuce, and squash, among other things. Egyptians traded throughout the ancient world. Grain became their main export, and they sold food to neighboring countries. As a result, they imported a wide range of commodities and raw resources, including ceramics from Palestine and gemstones from India and Central Asia. Wood from Lebanon was also imported, a rare and expensive product in Egypt's desert climate. They also brought in wine from Greece, Palestine, and Syria. Spices and diamonds were also transported by ancient Egyptian traders from Punt in East Africa. To this day, the ancient Egyptian language remains a mystery. Egyptologists have worked hard and have even rediscovered the ancient Egyptians' consonants. They also managed to rediscover the ancient Egyptian language's sentence structure, as well as how words develop and alter with tenses. The most difficult difficulty, however, is the ancient Egyptian language's vowels. Egyptologists believe the language had a maximum of nine vowels, with three short vowels and three long vowels. This makes it impossible to speak ancient Egyptian, at least for the time being. There were two alphabets in ancient Egypt. The most well-known are the hieroglyphs, with each image expressing a distinct concept. Individual hieroglyphs combine to form words, and many distinct combinations result in single phrases. However, hieroglyphs are a difficult technique to write, especially when keeping records. This prompted the ancient Egyptians to create the hieratic alphabet, a simpler alphabet designed for everyday usage. However, knowledge of how to read and write hieroglyphs or hieratic vanished with the Roman Empire. What exactly did this mean? As a result, the ancient Egyptian language was lost for millennia until the Rosetta Stone was discovered in 1799. It was written in three separate alphabets, 
hieroglyphic, hieratic, and Greek. In other words, it provided context for Egyptologists to finally rediscover how to read and write ancient Egyptian. Several fragments of ancient Egyptian literature have been discovered by archaeologists. Egyptologists regard the Middle Kingdom story of Sinuhe, in particular, as a classic of ancient Egyptian literature. It narrates the account of Sinuhe, an official in Prince Senesret's service who travels into exile following the death of Pharaoh Amenemhet the first he married into the Amunenshi tribe and rose to prominence as a warrior. His fame eventually reaches Egypt, when Senesre becomes Pharaoh. Senesre I then invites Sinuhe to return to Egypt, which he does, and the Pharaoh welcomes him with honor. Sinuhe spends the remainder of his life in royal favor, and when he dies, he is buried in the royal necropolis. The ancient Egyptians placed a high importance on hygiene. They washed frequently and used animal fat and chalk soap. They also shaved all of their body hair and utilized a variety of ointments to prevent body odor while also soothing their skin in Egypt's arid heat. The ancient Egyptians also created the world's first toothpaste, which was made of dried iris flowers, mint, pepper, and rock salt. They used their teeth to massage the toothpaste onto their teeth because they didn't have toothbrushes. Furthermore, they circumcised their male children when they were around the age of 12. When it comes to attire, the Egyptians had their own set of rules. For one thing, until the age of six, children went around naked. They carried protection amulets and jewelry even before then. The ancient Egyptians also preferred to wear plant fibers, typically linen, because they considered animal fibers such as wool to be ritually impure. The wealthy, on the other hand, wore woolen overcoats but removed them before entering holy sites such as temples. In general, ancient Egyptians chose not to dye their clothing, preferring to wear them in their natural color. Slaves normally worked naked, but most employees wore a linen loincloth. They also had a large selection of makeup and jewelry. Jewelry, in particular, added a splash of color to the otherwise plain aspect of ancient Egyptian attire. As previously said, ancient Egypt had an abundance of gold, making it a popular material for jewelry manufacture. In fact, the ancient Egyptians valued silver more than gold since they had to import it from Asia. Gemstones shipped all the way from Afghanistan have also become popular for use in jewelry. Various ores and minerals were also employed as cosmetics by the ancient Egyptians. They applied henna to their hands and nails, galena as eyeliner, malachite as eyeshadow, and ochre as lipstick. The ancient Egyptians had many methods to pass the time. Music, given by a variety of instruments like as flutes, harps, oboes, and trumpets, was especially popular among the upper class. The ancient Egyptians in general enjoyed board games such as Sayat and Mayan, though the rules were lost with the fall of the Roman Empire. Juggling and ball games were particularly popular among children, while wrestling was a popular activity in general. The ancient Egyptians worshipped numerous gods. The sun god is the most powerful of the Egyptian gods and goddesses. Ra was the most powerful of them all. The ancient Egyptians thought he crossed the skies on a large ship every day, bringing light to the globe. When night fell, it indicated Ra had visited the afterlife, bringing light with him. Osiris, his wife Isis, and their son Horus were also important gods. The pharaohs regarded Osiris and Isis as common ancestors, and themselves as Horus in human form. As the goddess of fertility, Horus' wife Hathor was also significant. Despite his epic feud with Osiris, Seth was also revered as Egypt's heavenly guardian and the god of the desert. He also protected foreigners who came to Egypt peacefully. The jackal deity Anubis guarded the dead on their way to final judgment and transported him to the afterlife if they died. Mummification has heavy religious overtones. Even though a person's spirit left their body when they died, the ancient Egyptians believed that body and soul will reconnect in the afterlife. This meant keeping the body from rotting after death, because the spirit would never find peace in the afterlife without the body. In fact, the ancient Egyptians considered destroying the body after death to be the most severe punishment they could impose on their prisoners. After they were executed, the ancient Egyptians would burn the criminals' bodies and stamp on the ashes with a herd of donkeys. This would spread the ashes into the air, where they would be blown away by the wind, ensuring that the criminals' spirits would never be at peace even after death. The ancient Egyptians devised a complicated method for mummifying their deceased. At least for the wealthy and powerful. The poor used to simply bury their dead in the desert, where the heat and dry sand kept the remains from decaying. Professional embalmers, on the other hand, meticulously removed certain organs from the wealthy, the intestines, liver, lungs, and stomach. 
They stored these organs in canopic jars with preservatives, each guarded by one of Horus' four sons. Before allowing the dead into the afterlife, embalmers left the heart in the body for Osiris to assess. The brain was extracted by embalmers, but because it held no religious value, it was discarded. They then dried the body with natron salt before adding additional preservatives. They then wrapped linen cloth around the body, inserting amulets between the layers to protect him from demons on their journey to the afterlife. Egypt's military was formidable. Their most effective soldiers were archers, who were trained to move rapidly and in formation. This enabled them to maintain a safe distance from the enemy while also letting them to aim and fire efficiently in vast numbers. Other soldiers were tasked with keeping the adversary away from the archers, usually using spear and shield combinations. The ancient Egyptians also utilized a specialty sword called a kopesh, which was designed to compensate for the deficiencies of bronze and was used from the New Kingdom onward. Egyptians also utilized chariots, which were frequently driven by aristocrats and officers, to strike the decisive blow against an enemy army. Ancient Egypt had a great navy as well, but used different tactics than the Greeks and Romans. The Greeks used ramming techniques at sea, whilst the Romans preferred boarding operations. Instead, the ancient Egyptians kept their ships at a safe distance and used archers to shower down arrows on opposing crews. The ancient Egyptians had a sophisticated understanding of mathematics. For starters, they employed the same base 10 number system as we have today. They also had a thorough command of mathematics, decimals, and rational equations. The ancient Egyptians even developed their own algebra, capable of solving quadratic equations. They also computed the Pythagorean theorem centuries before Pythagoras. Surprisingly, researchers have discovered nothing about geometric theory in rediscovered ancient Egyptian writings. This led him to believe that the ancient Egyptians' grasp of geometry was based on application rather than theory. This theory is supported by the precise arrangement of ancient Egyptian monuments, as well as the use of the golden ratio in the area of the Great Pyramid's base. The Egyptians had a sophisticated understanding of medicine. In fact, when it came to medical science, the Greeks and Romans looked up to the ancient Egyptians. Egyptian physicians were in high demand throughout the Mediterranean until the fall of the Roman Empire. They had a basic understanding of sanitation and used a variety of medicines to prevent infection in wounds. As a result, they insisted on using clean and fresh linen for bandages. Doctors also possessed improved burn treatments, as well as knowledge of how to perform surgery, set bones, and even perform amputations. Amputees could expect prosthesis to replace lost limbs, while surgery patients should expect plenty of painkillers. Nonetheless, the ancient Egyptians had their share of superstition when it came to medicine particularly for ailments for which the doctors had no remedy, such as malaria. Patients could only pray to the gods for healing in certain instances. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe to our channel, since we will be covering a lot of similar content in the future. Till next time, stay curious.